You're listening to Fair Play on JusticeNews.com. David Thorne has spent the last two decades behind the prison walls of Ohio State Prison for a crime he says he did not commit. He says he was wrongfully convicted in 1999 for the brutal murder of Yvonne Lane, who was also the mother of his son. This is Fair Play on JusticeNews.net. Hey, David, how you doing, man? Not too bad. What's up? Hey man, it's been a, I mean, it's been a long, long time waiting, and now finally we're having it, man. I tell you, I was gonna say you must have had your phone in your hand because it only rang once on my side. So yeah, I was like, I was just on it, man. I was like a hawk just sitting <laughs> on the phone. I didn't want to miss it, man. No, that's cool. Yeah, how you been, man? What's going on? Ah, freezing. We've got about a foot of snow, and it's still snowing. Wow, man. We we have a little bit of snow. It's just uh, it's just kind of like drying up now, but we still have some, but not as much as you guys. Yeah. So first up, man, I really appreciate you taking the time, David. I know how difficult it is, so thank you so much for making this call happen. No problem. Thank you for allowing it to happen. All right. So if you could take us back in time and and tell us in your own words, David, what happened? How did you end up in the situation? Do you want me to start from like? prior to everything happening or once I was arrested No man I want to go back in time exactly you know like let's take one step at a time let's go exactly back in time and start from day 1 Okay uh I guess the best part would be to start when Yvonne and I first got in contact with each other again to go for Brandon's paternity test Okay that would probably be the best starting point I guess Okay I didn't know Well, this actually goes back a little bit further. I didn't know that she was pregnant. Essentially, she got pregnant the the month that we broke up, which happened to be a February. Mm. She called me up later saying that she felt that she was having a miscarriage, and this is the first that I'm even hearing that she was pregnant. So I go over to her house, but I told her I said, "Look, I said I I have my car apart. The only way I can get over there is if the girl that I'm dating brings me over there." She said she didn't care that she had to go to the hospital. We go over. She comes out the house, like dressed as if she's getting ready to to go to a club. I mean, she's dressed to the nines, hair's done, makeup's done. She looked good, and, and I mean, no way did she look like she was pregnant. She wasn't showing. There was, you know, she had on like a heavy sweatshirt type thing, but she just looked like she was getting ready to go out. Then she got mad at me, saying that she didn't think that I was really bringing the girl that I was dating. That you know, so they actually started to get into an argument, and she kicked the girl's car that I had showed up in, and she flicked her cigarette in at the girl in the car. Man, I scooped her up around her waist, and I walked her up to the house, and her mom come out. So her mom started talking to her, calmed her down. They walked in the house, and we left. So by no means did I think that she was truly pregnant. I thought that that was just her way of getting me to come over. Yeah. Then fast forward, she calls me up saying that I'm going to be getting contacted by Children's Services to come in for a DNA test. I go for the DNA test, and I mean, as soon as I walk in, I see Brandon. He's almost 15. maybe 18 months at this time. So like I said, this is you know, half of a pregnancy and then his age coming in. So this is almost 2 years, 20 months since I had seen her the previous time when she said that she was having the miscarriage. Mm. But as soon as I seen Brandon, there was there was no mistake and he was mini me. I mean, he looked like me whenever I was his age. All the way to the point that I had him just sitting there going through pictures on the wall of family members you know and it was a a picture of me and i i asked him i said who's that and he's like me and i said no that was me when i was a little bit older than you and he's like me <laughs> and he was actually he grabbed my nose and turned my face to him and looked me straight in the eye and kind of growled at me like me and i'm like trust me i dress you better than that cuz you know I, i was in a it was early 70s so figure i was in a all red velour 
<laughs> yeah. Sweatsuit. I look like a skinny little blonde-haired Santa. But, I mean, I, I still had to take the test because, you know, that was mandated by the courts and everything. But her and I talked in the hallway then, and I was over at her house probably two days later. And, you know, I was going over to her house, which was actually relatively close to where I worked. So I would go over to the house. I'd, I'd stop by sometimes once or twice a day. You know, if I was going for lunch in that area, I'd stop over or whatever. And then, you know, in the evenings, I'd go over and spend time because it's not like I could just pick him up and leave mm. because he doesn't know me. Mm. You know, it took him a while to warm up to me to even... You know, just be there at the house playing and everything, but, you know, it, it didn't really take all that long, but, you know, it, 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 I mean, I feel that, you know. This call is originating from an Ohio correctional facility and may be recorded and monitored. I feel that some sort of deep connection is, is made with the paternal instinct, so I, I think he kind of knew who I was. You know, and then, granted, as he got older, of course he knew who I was. But, uh, her and I kind of started to resume a relationship to the point that we started talking about, you know, potentially moving and maybe putting the family together. Mm -hmm. She was she was active in a lawsuit for. Can I say? the name sure because it's it's one of her children so uh she was active in a lawsuit for they didn't clear his sinuses and everything to get him breathing as fast as what they should have or whatever so it was her attorneys and everything were claiming brain damage was due to the hospital's negligence so specifically what the case is or anything like that i don't really know but that was the logistics of it hmm she was looking that it was a, I believe it was an $8 million lawsuit that she said, you know, as her and I were talking, that she would settle if they offered five. But she was to the point that she goes, look, you know, she was, she was annoyed with the father to her other kids to the point that she said that, you know, she would agree for him to have custody you know, not giving up her parental rights, but just him having custody to kind of get him out of her hair so that she could move without him harassing her. Hmm. And that's where, you know, her and I were kind of at, at at this point because she said that, you know, I was, I was, at that point, I was still in the midst of trying to start my own little automotive shop and everything and I was working at another place that I made parts and worked on cars and everything and she was basically you know one of her enticements which I mean you know other than she was obviously a, a pretty girl so it wasn't like it was hard to get a young guy to, to listen to her talk but she was potentially going to have the money to just fund uh, a whole shop and I could just be up and running wherever I went without having to worry about true overhead and everything. Mm. So, you know, I mean, of course that's a, that's an enticing offer. Yeah. You know what I mean? But then why would you hurt her, man? I mean, if she's, if, she, if you and, if you and her are, have such a, you guys have such, am, you're back in amicable terms and she's going to fund your operation. Why would you want to hurt her? Exactly. Okay, continue, man. You know, and, and 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 that was also one of the things that I had said. My dad died in the service, so I had his insurance money and everything that I put into stocks and, and a different portfolio and everything. Mm. The, the the day that I found out that I even had Brandon, I was I was capable of writing a check for 18 years worth of child support on the spot. Beautiful money was was never an issue I mean I I made good money for the time I mean you know who wouldn't want to make more money in their life but I made great money at the time I had everything that I needed granted you know nobody ever has everything that they want but I didn't 
truly want for anything is, you know, within reason, but I never wished any ill will to her whatsoever. The, the only caveat to my whole thing was the girl that I was dating at the time, you know, I had no true reason to break up with her either, mm. you know, other than I had to figure out whether I wanted to put together the family or to, to be with this girl and continue to do what I was doing. Mm. So, I mean, it was, I was torn because I liked them both. Mm. But the reason that Yvonne and I even broke up was because of her ex, which his name is Eric, because he would just show up at my house. Uh, I had painted a car, and I had called the customer up and told him on like a Tuesday or a Wednesday that he could come and pick it up on that Saturday. And Friday night, the, the dogs start going crazy. I let them out. And they run off towards the woods and everything and by the time I call them back I come out with a flashlight going through the yard and everything and somebody had keyed the car and kicked in the rear quarter. This call is originating from an Ohio correctional facility and may be recorded and monitored. Just kicked in the rear quarter of the car that I had just finished for a customer. Man. So I mean, you know, I had to call him and tell him that you know, something happened to his car that I was going to have to repair it, that it wasn't going to be available when I told him. Did you report that to the cops? No, because if I do, then my insurance and everything goes up, and I was I was just starting to get going, so I, I had to eat it. Hmm. You know, the biggest expense for me was to repaint, and the only thing that truly saved me is that it being a custom color, hmm. whenever you order through PPG and, and the different you know, House of Color, those places, when you order custom colors, they give you a set batch. So I had more paint than I needed. Mm. So I was able to fix it. But the time, you know, that car gets set back, so then that puts every other project that you have set back. Yeah. And, you know, and then that's money out of my pocket. And, you know, like I said, I didn't know that she was pregnant in the month that we had broke up. And so that was... Even she understood, you know, we didn't even argue in the breakup. So, I mean... But what about the DNA? The DNA test came and it was positive. You you, you were the dad. Oh, yeah. I was like 99.999 something. Yeah, there was no... No doubt about yeah. it with DNA. So you had yeah. DNA evidence that that's your boy. Yep. Okay. So, so obviously, somebody was pissed off at you, man. I don't know whether it was me or her. I, I, I think that somehow it could have been something that she had going on that nobody really knew about. It just entangled me and with shoddy police work. I mean, it, it, what, it's, what it seems like is that something happened while you were in and out of her life with some other dude and some other things that were going on and then once you got back into her life, that wasn't liked, and you became a target. That very well could be, but that's just it. I don't know. You know, this this the hardest thing on this whole case is to prove a negative. You know what I mean? I I don't have the answers, and I can't even fathom an answer because. I wasn't in her life that whole time, so I don't know what was going on. And up until the point that I got, this says how long ago it was, I got a page from my grandfather saying to call when he told me that, you know, her parents had called to try to get a hold of me saying that this had happened to her. Up until that point, I had a normal, albeit like a boring, common person life. This call is originating from an Ohio correctional facility and may be recorded and monitored. So what happened after the key inc incident, you, you fixed the car, and then what happened? I, uh, just, I just had to fix it and just eat the, eat the cost of it and hmm. send it out to save the, the face of the company so that, you know, there was no, no reason that he should, you know, say anything bad about the the work or the shop or anything but yeah you know then he's 
he would start coming over more often or there was times that he was supposed to have the kids. Mm. You know, they had made arrangements. He'd call, say that he wants to come and pick them up, have them for the weekend. And then at the last minute, he would call and say he's not coming. But he's like, well, so much for whatever plans you guys had. And then he would hang up. Okay. Brandon was staying with me off and on the whole time. There was no... Even whenever we went through uh, the paternity suit and everything like that, you know, because that was, she was getting assistance. So I don't know whether it was full welfare or what, but the the judge told me that because I was in Brandon's life from the time that she, you know, even brought him around and I took the test, even before it came through that it was positive that he was mine, which I mean, you could obviously tell by sight. The, the judge said that I didn't have to pay for the birthing costs or anything like that. He he waived everything up to, let's say, that day in court. He said that my child support will start then. Mm-hmm. He said any money that I give her will just be a gift because, you know, the money comes from my check at the, at the shop, and that's what pays because, you know, her money comes from the actual state or the government, however you want to say it. So even whenever everything was said and done, I was two months into the arrears, which was 700 and some odd dollars, because I paid 360, 355, 365, somewhere around there for child support. So it was two months by the time he ordered it, and that my shop that I was working at full time, my my regular job. By the time they got the paperwork and then processed it and started taking the money out and sending it in, I was two months behind. And that's Mm. not my fault or the shop's fault, you know, or even the children's services. It's just... This call is originating from an Ohio correctional facility and may be recorded and monitored. It's just how long it took to process the paperwork. But even that was paid before I was... uh, convicted and everything I was I was caught up it was seven hundred dollars because I mean if if well they did say that I didn't want to pay the child support so for seven hundred dollars do you know how many people were in arrears tens of thousands of dollars so I mean that's not like that's an excuse to try to kill somebody that's just not yeah not even logical that's bullshit man and it's, it's and especially with me having the the annuity and the and the uh, my my portfolio, like I said, I could have paid in one check all 18 years of child support and never once had to have anything taken out. But they said that you know that I can't do that because if I get a job that pays more than my obviously my child support would go up. So they don't do that. But I could have. It's not like I was broke. Hmm. So then what happened? Whenever I got the call from my grandfather saying that this had happened, I go over to her mom and dad's house. Where were you at that time? At the time of the murder, where were you? Okay, see, I don't know any of this had transpired. So, but, you know, in retrospect with everything going, the time that they said her time of death, I was at a martial arts class in Independence, Ohio which is two two or three counties away. It would be impossible for you to commit this murder, David. Correct. I, I was there with uh, three or four different people that knew that I was going to be there because of all things that happened at this time. I actually had a lion cub with me whenever I went to the class. And obviously you have uh, witnesses who would testify that this guy was with us. Correct. And that's that's where my problems lie because now they're saying that Joe was the one that said that he did this and that you know he's he was convinced to tell them that I was the one that wanted it done so he was doing it on my behalf yeah but that's just one man's testimony which is probably false how do they prove that this guy's right they don't actually have anything to prove that he did it other than him saying he did it. Hmm. I mean, they have 
no blood on his person. The the knife that they said that he used, which is a, a folding lock blade knife, they he, you know, they took him to where they get it out of this storm sewer, and he says that that's it. But the blade on it is 3.1 inches long, but the wound is over four inches deep. Mm. So I mean, it it, poss- it can't possibly go that deep without the handle going in. And they said that it was a clean cut, so they know that it was a, a single action, that there wasn't hesitation or defensive wounds or, you know, that it was just one cut, almost nine inches in length. And Man. and for this knife to have no blood on it whatsoever. Impossible. That's impossible. That's that's like saying a gun that's never been fired is the, is the, the weapon that shot somebody. Because even your blood pressure... Okay, your household sink is only 30, 35 pounds of pressure. Think twice twice the pressure on full blast and run your hand under it and come out dry. That's that's what you're asking this knife to do. Mm. It's 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 impossible. And then he had no blood on his clothes. They claimed that I transported him that my car was clean but in unclean condition. And that's you know, saying that it's neat and tidy, but it wasn't like freshly cleaned, like you're trying to hide anything. You know what I mean? So, so their wording, their what? What were they expecting that he'd be naked in the car with you? I guess so, because whenever they did the car, I I I had said this before on on on, on one of the shows. I said, look, as a person, anybody can lie. But science doesn't lie. There was no blood, no fingerprints, no hair samples, skin cells, sweat cells, couch fibers, carpet fibers. It just didn't happen. How how can how can you not have any type of transfer whatsoever? So you're saying that I went from somebody that has a bunch of speeding tickets to out of the clear blue, a criminal mastermind. Hmm. So. You- you're an independent, she's an alliance, and they're saying that this guy did it because you asked him to, and then you drove him around. Yeah, they said that I drove him around beforehand and afterhand, but nobody ever saw us together or anything like that. And they said that after he killed her, they said that he walked, and it's it's four, it's either three point whatever miles, almost four miles, or four point whatever, almost five miles from her house to the hotel that he was staying at. There's dozens of car lots, banks, uh, fast food places. Do you know how many security cameras and how many people in this, in the whole city of Alliance that he would have walked past that nobody saw a bloody person walking in? That's not including getting into the hotel to his room and then where they claim that I picked him up the morning after. Hmm and never saw any of this transpire. So without any evidence, they just put together a story and said that that's it? They, they said that they didn't need to do... Okay, they didn't test DNA in the room. They didn't test DNA on different things in the house. There was chewing gum, a man's ring, cigarettes that were two different... This call is originating from an Ohio correctional facility and may be recorded and monitored. Two different brands of cigarettes that were in the ashtrays right there in two adjoining rooms that they said that this happened in. So there were two people there, that means, other than the lady? Well, there had to be somebody there. We don't, you know, and that's where we're, that's what I'm saying is that we need the DNA tested because there was two different brands of cigarettes so somebody had to be smoking with her. She she had her brand and a pack of cigarettes that was there. So whoever was the other one. And then of all things, the if you look at like a uh, like the chopping block that has all the different household knives in it, the steak knives at the bottom, and the you know the the, the like a fillet knife, the big chopping knife, and the all the other stuff in them wooden blocks. Hmm. The big knife, like what you would have from all the scary movies, the the big chopping knife that's in the center of it, hmm. that one was missing from her house. 
there was a knife that was the same that was found that they believe is a thumbprint due to the size and the angle that was found on a street going away from her house in the direction that one of two different eyewitnesses that they withheld from me said that they saw somebody leaving the house and going that direction with a black trash bag. Mm. So that, that brings up two things. Why did somebody take that knife? And whoever was leaving that house, there was no forced entry. Mm. So whoever was leaving that house... She knew him. No force... Say again? She knew the guy. She knew whoever it was. So if there was no forced entry and you know him, so there, evidently somebody was let in, why didn't that person call 911? Because the, the coroner and everything said that she had died the previous night in around, he said, sometimes, sometime after 7 p.m. He said 7 p.m. and then they kind of elongated the time to, to allow them having Joe walk from one side of town to the other. But if you know this person, they're already dead in the house. Why didn't you call 911? Because that was not their objective. Correct. And, and here's the thing. Both eyewitnesses. One person said that they saw a person of this description in the evening. And you have one minute remaining. One person said that they saw the person of this description in the morning after everything happened. Both of them gave the description of 5'8 to 5'10, shoulder length brown hair, and 180 pounds. And that. Thank you for using. You're listening to Fair Play on JusticeNews.net. Hello, this is a free call from. David. To accept this free call, press zero. This call is from a correction facility and is subject to monitoring and recording. Hello? Hey, David, how you doing, man? Not too bad. How about yourself? I'm doing good. Thank you. I was going to say, did you get my email? Yeah. Did you get my email earlier? Yeah, yeah. I just, okay. I just got your email, man. All right. Did I wake you up? Uh, I had a very, very uh, long night, man. Somebody, I had to talk to somebody, and I spoke to like about, I think about like 5 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. So... You know, but no worries, man. I mean, I gotta do what I gotta do, and you gotta do what you gotta do. But if, so, if uh, you, how much time do we have right now? I I have a full half hour. Any any time that it calls, I get a I get a half hour. Okay. But I was gonna say if go ahead if you wanted me to call if you wanted me to call later, I can call later so that you can get some sleep. Fuck my sleep, man. I want you to back out with your son. <laughs> And go fishing again. I appreciate that. Cause, you know, it's I, I need you just as uh, sharp as it is to make sure if there's anything that you have a question on that you know it's. Yeah, I I'm sharp. Okay. If I fuck up, just bring me back. <laughs> All right. So let's take it from where we stopped. Let's start a day before the murder. Okay before April 1st, 1999, right? So a day before that, where were you? What were you doing? Okay, my my normal day, you know, I clock in between 4.30 and 5 o'clock in the morning. And that, the Wednesday beforehand, which is what they're saying, that that's the night that it happened. I didn't find out until that Thursday. But... That Wednesday, I clocked in like normal at work between 4.30 and 5 o'clock in the morning. Mm. I clocked out at 12.30, and I went to a pet store that I frequent a lot because I bought goldfish and everything to as feeder fish to feed uh, a bigger tank that I had that had Oscars and, and the uh, different uh, fish in. So, like, I would probably assume that that would be about 1 to one fifteen, you know, giving me about a half hour, 45 minutes to get there from the shop and to buy everything. I went home, I fed the big fish tank, and I cleaned Asia's pen, which was the lion that I had at the, at the time at the house. And I fed her like, a, you know, just the way I would have normally done. I cleaned out my dog's pen, 
and I was leaving to go to the girl that I was dating at the time. I was on my way to her house, and I saw Joe walking down the street. I picked him up. I normally went through this little drive through that was in uh, Randolph, and he informed me that he was actually staying with people behind that behind the uh the drive through mm. so i went in i met the enox and they saw the lion for the first time you know to be a lion for the first time in person mm. so like i stayed there for a little while and then uh went through the drive through and i went back to the girl's house that i was originally dating at the time mm. we just waited i got uh my ritual was I always went to Subway because then I would eat like half a sandwich because on my way to my martial arts class, you know, you don't want a full stomach whenever you're rolling and, you know, doing all the different exercises and everything. But This call is originating from an Ohio correctional facility and may be recorded and monitored. We went to uh, take the lion to the class. So, like... I was waiting on my my girlfriend's cousin, which is Josh. He had a van. We loaded Asia up into the van, and we went to my martial arts class. Uh, one of the one of the discrepancies that they always harped on was saying that Joe said that I went to a, uh, a gas station or a dairy mart or something like that so that I would be on camera, you know. Mm. And I was like, what what would that matter? Because we went to the gas station. I would probably say seven to eight o'clock. That has nothing to do with, you know, whatever it is that he was saying. Mm. But Josh went in and got gas and everything, and we went to the martial arts class, and that was, you know, we got there at about eight o'clock, which is the normal time. Mm. We went through the class. Everybody got to see the lion and that, and we left. And the one specific thing that just clicked all the time is because coming back from the class as soon as we got close to seeing Amy's house I saw that her grandfather had already beat us to the house and my car was parked in his spot that was kind of one of his only little pet peeves was that you know I beat you I wasn't taking it yeah and so you know I I, I looked at the clock on his radio and it was 1129 mm. so that was that's why that's kind of ingrained you know but other than that mm. uh, just swapped out her or the pen from her pen Asia's pen from the van to my car and I went home is this March 30th, 30th or or a couple of days uh, you, you said so when exactly is that uh, day, uh, the date do you remember yeah. the date that would have been the 31st that's the day that all this was supposed to happen to where they said that he went over and killed her that evening yeah because he, the body. he was he was yeah he was trying to say that i was running around with him the whole day and everything as to where i can i can verify where i was at yeah and did you know this guy prior to this I've known him for a little while. I met him through different friends. He wasn't originally a friend of mine. I met him through somebody that came over with their car. And then I've, I've seen him around at different parties and then just, you know, seeing him more and more of him and I started talking. That's how we got to know each other. Hmm. And did you guys have any fights or arguments or did, did, you, did you think this guy had, had something uh, against you? No. I mean, that was that was even one of the points that I had made with my attorney because they're saying that, you know, if I ask this man to do something on my behalf, he told on me for a, a car window that he broke. Mm -hmm. He was he was actually in a physical altercation with somebody and broke a car window. So then people called the cops on him. And then whenever they went to him. You know, he told them that it was me, and he apologized to me afterwards, saying that he was just afraid that his mom and dad would kick him out of the house if he got in trouble. So, you know. When was that? 
Oh, I have not a clue. Well, how long ago was that? Prior to murder. So uh, bef- that was before 1999? It, maybe in the summer of that. Maybe a little bit earlier. That my my time has changed since I've been down because it's, you know, I, I live a perpetual groundhog day now. So it's, my time runs together. So I couldn't tell you. It was, mm. it was some time before I was arrested. Yeah, so, uh, so not not summer. I think the best way to say it is that you know sometime before uh, you got arrested. So what happened, David? Then what happened? You reached there to w- w- you were talking about reaching Amy's house, right? Uh, yeah, on the way home. Hmm. I was gonna say that's where I took you know Asia's pen from Josh's van, put her in my car, and went home. What did you do then? You re- reached home. Then what happened? I mean, I just put the uh, put the cat in her pen and everything, and and then as I was going to uh, to sleep, just to make sure, like, yeah, I got home because you know you're always kind of tired and beat up after classes like that. Mm. Amy would call, and I actually had a uh, uh, the phone records that they they had given us and everything, so it said that I had gotten a call from Amy at. 12:10 a.m. and the conversation lasted for 13 minutes and 46 seconds. Mm. And so then after I talked to her, I just took my shower and went to sleep. Okay. And then Thursday Thursday morning, you know, I clocked in around six o'clock. It's usually a little bit later on the days after my martial arts class because you know I get in so late. But uh, I took the uh, lion into. No, no, no. I I went over. I left the shop around 10, 15 or so. I went to AutoZone to see Jason Ott and see if he'd be there to bring Asia back for, you know, for Friday morning. But I went to McDonald's. I got uh, breakfast and everything for the guys at the shop and everything, but they didn't get the order right. So I went back in and uh, because I... You know they didn't get the order right so i go back in and they gave me pretty much almost all the food and everything that was left because they were switching going from breakfast to lunch so anything that was up there they just threw in the bag and i took it back to the shop and that's one of the things that uh charlie even testified to is that whenever i came back that the the food was still warm Mm. and This call is originating from an Ohio correctional facility and may be recorded and monitored. Then you fast forward to about 1230. That's whenever I got a page from my grandfather saying what had happened. And I flew over to Yvonne's parents' house. And whenever I walked in, you know, uh, her mom was crying, but her dad was walking up from the basement. It's like a bi-level house. So when you walk in, you either go steps down or steps up. He was coming up the steps. He had laundry. And so, like, I'm trying to ask him what was going on and everything. And, I mean, he was obviously, he was upset and everything, but he wasn't really talking. So Tanya was the one trying to tell me and explain what was happening. And, I mean, I got I got Brandon. And I whenever I was leaving, the only thing that, was lucky for me as I had my own car seat and everything for him because whenever I picked him up he literally just had on a diaper and one sock whenever they let him go back in the house to get some stuff they wouldn't let him go through and get all the kids clothes and everything so then whenever I brought Brandon home he had on a diaper and a single sock uh, I want to go back a little bit so when you when your first grand when your grandfather how did your grandfather found out they called him who called him? Yvonne, Yvonne's, Yvonne's parents called him okay. looking for me. They called the house. Is that your only family that you had? In that area, yeah. Oh, okay. So so just, just to uh, be clear, uh, we're talking about all of this occurring, obviously, in Alliance, and you are in Independence, right? You mean like whenever this actually happened? Yeah, when this occurred. Okay. This occurred... 
in Alliance. Yes. And when you received the call, you were not in Alliance. You were in Independence, right? No. Whenever I received the call, I was in the Alliance area because where she lived was not far from the shop that I was working at. Oh, okay. Okay, got it. So the night whenever the, the night whenever everything happened, mm. it happened in Alliance, but I was in Independence. Okay, got it. So, you know, they found her body on April 1st. Right. So They're saying that it happened March 31st. March 31st. Between 10, between 10 and 11, but the coroner said that it happened at 7 o'clock. Yeah, the coroner said that uh, anything, anytime after 7 o'clock. So between 7 and 11 on 31st, you have people proving that you were with them. Correct. If I'm correct. Yes. Right? Yes. This call is originating from an Ohio correctional facility and may be recorded and monitored. So despite the fact that there were so many suspects, why did they come after you? I really don't know. I, I know that whenever they had talked to several people and everything, that they said that I was a spoiled rich kid, but everything that I had, I worked. You know what I mean? I had my own job. I bought my own stuff. It's not like I was one of the kids born with a platinum spoon in their mouth or anything. My mom and I were poor. But, you know, I I just tried to make sure that whenever I bought something, that I bought something nice. I didn't, and then, you know, I worked on cars. That's what I did. So, of course, I had a nice vehicle. Yeah. When you're... But other when you're, than that... Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Other than that? I was going to say, other than that, whenever I went in on that Friday, because they came to the house Thursday night, and I wasn't there whenever they came to the house. So Friday, I go into the, the police department. I had already been ruled out. When they came to your grandparents' house, you went to the police station. Correct. The next morning. Yes, sir. Back up a little bit. When your grandfather first called you, mm -hmm. between these things, when was the last time you spoke to Yvonne? I picked up Yvonne, or I went to Yvonne's house and I picked up Brandon. I want to say that Friday beforehand, my grandfather had, had dropped him off because my grandfather wanted to go somewhere with him. I forget what it is that he had planned with Brandon. And then I stopped over, I want to say like, I want to say Monday after work because I usually checked on him to see you know, if everything was all right, if they needed anything, because her car wasn't uh, the most reliable. Her car, Yvonne's car. Yeah. Well, she didn't actually have a car. She usually borrowed a car, and it wasn't very dependable. It's just mind blowing that you know a guy who's been trying to take care of this woman and help and is not fighting back and accepting everything, and they come and pin this thing on probably the guy who. Probably the only guy who cared for this woman, they come and pin it on him. Which is like a typical bullshit uh, way of these guys to come and take the wrong guy. But when your grandfather called you, man, and the first time you heard that, how, what, how, what went through your mind? I mean, I was in disbelief because, I mean, you know, the shock of being what you're told. And then the realization of you kind of coming to grips to it. I mean, you don't really, you don't hear or see these things in, in normal life. You know what I mean? That's like your, your movies and the, and the, that type of stuff. So, I mean, so whenever it actually was being told to me, I mean, it was just disbelief, I guess. Cause I mean, it's, to the point that you just can't really believe the words that you're hearing. I mean, you know, you're you're hearing it, but you know, there's a difference between hearing somebody and listening to somebody. And I mean, I hear what he's saying, but it just doesn't make sense because in my mind, you know, why would anybody hurt her? And there's something I felt like something had to be wrong in the in the communication of this that it's it's not her, it's mistaken. There's something something wrong. 
And then whenever uh, he's like, you got to go over and get Brandon, it, you know, he's at her grandparents' house. When I went over, I mean, hmm. the dad had saw her. I guess at one point in time, he said that he actually had to step over her to get some of the stuff for the clothes and some of the stuff that they allowed him to get. So, I mean, he was, I mean, uh, lack of a better word, I guess he was zombified because he was just walking around doing menial household chore type stuff, just solemn, like no, no true expression, not even really talking. And here's me talking to her mother and, and I'm only understanding every other word in between her crying and I mean, it's just, it was just so surreal to the point that it was like, this just can't be happening. And yet it's unfolding before your very eyes. Yeah. Did they live with her? No, she lived on uh, Divine, I believe it was. But she had, she had lived at that house off and on, you know, just throughout life. But whenever her and I first started dating, she lived at that house. And she was kind of going back between that house and the, oh, what, I'm trying to think of the, uh, the grandmother's name on the other side of her kids, Eric's mom, uh, Linda. She was staying at Linda's house. Mm -hmm. so, you know, she would kind of float back and forth, but she lived by herself and her mom is the one that actually found her because she went to pick up Preston for school. Yeah, so Preston was there when this occurred. Correct. Shit, man. Preston was there, Brandon was there, uh, Trenton and Vinny. This call is originating from an Ohio correctional facility and may be recorded and monitored. Tony, which is her oldest, mm wasn't there he stays with her mom and dad mm. but to this day even even Preston has done interviews and everything on my behalf where you know he he said he's heard everything that's been said and you know from him knowing me back then which he admits that you know he was young but he said that he's you know looked into things and questioned different things on his own and he himself believes in me and it's not like it's just my son that believes in me because i'm his dad this is another child of the victim somebody that was obviously brutally murdered and he still has faith in me i think the entire united states of america believes you <laughs> except the fucking bastards who are trying to screw you you know yeah yeah except the people who are trying to put you down everyone else believes you and and that's where i've been fighting for dna so much because they say that i'm not entitled to it because they concede that i'm not there but then they say joe's not entitled to it because he took a plea bargain mm. but because he pled out to murder or hire murder anybody that pleads out to murder or a higher charge are unable to withdraw their pleas mm. anything else you can withdraw your plea on and try to fight your case except for whenever they arrest you and book you on murder if you plea out to that you cannot withdraw your plea yeah and he came in go ahead no i was gonna say he came in for a post-conviction he testified that he didn't do it that i never asked him to do it and that's where we brought in two i well one eyewitness came in and said that you know he saw somebody coming out of the house in the morning with a, a trash bag that was five eight five ten shoulder length brown hair and about 180 pounds and in the direction that he went between the houses that's where they found the butcher knife that would be like a, the big knife that was in the center of your chopping block of the collection of household knives and it has a thumbprint on it and once again that person's leaving a house that was entered without force 
So evidently. This call is originating from an Ohio correctional facility and may be recorded and monitored. So this is somebody that knows her and they never called 911. And the, the fact is that I'm 6'1", I wear a size 12 shoe. My co-defendant is 6'4", and he's probably a 12, if not better. And they've got a size 10 footprint in the blood. Yeah. That, that nobody can account for. And, and the problem with Joe's uh, plea uh, and everything else uh, is that it was coercion. Yeah. I mean, clearly the guy was put in a position, forced and coerced, and lied to that you're in the next room, uh, you know, and then um, try to squeeze something out of this guy. It seems like the people who were trying to coerce Joe to get something out of it against you are trying to hide someone. It seems like it. I mean, I'm just trying to put two and two together. Yeah. Actually, there's there was a, a cop that was in the area that she had a complaint against and also Linda. Uh, he had gone to jail after this and I want to say that it was for rape, but I know that he's had issues and that he was discharged from the police department. Yeah. And like anybody else, you know, just over the course of, you know, multiple interviews with different people in town and anybody, because my wife has been my champion on this so far. She's She's gone and interviewed people that even the detectives and everything that have done other shows said that they wouldn't go and talk to. And to be honest, most of them didn't go and talk to him. So therefore everything has been skewed because even the detectives and my own attorneys never validated my own alibi. They keep trying to put me with Joe as to where I, at one point in time, I said that I'm at a pet store. I'm buying goldfish as feeder fish for another fish tank. They never went there. You know, you could have verified my receipt. You could have asked somebody if they saw me there. You could have seen, for all intents and purposes, his security cameras, mm. you know? Yeah. And then that would show that I'm not with you. You have one minute remaining. <laughs> You're listening You're to listening Fair, Play Fair Play on justicenews.net. Hello? Yeah, man, you're like clockwork, man. Yeah. It's just a, an act of God that you've been able to keep your sanity and stay sane and continue fighting this. I mean, it's, I've actually had a lot of guys ask me because, you know, you got to figure it's almost 22 years, you know? Mm. And uh, a couple of the guys said, you know, you always seem like happy go lucky. You know, I said, well, you know, you compartmentalize to a certain extent, but you know, if if I wasn't sound with myself, you, you couldn't be. If you're not honest with yourself, you can't be honest with anybody else. Mm. So I mean, you know, I have my truth. That's it. Mm. I can't I can't speak for anybody else. The only thing I can do is do my own thing, and this is me. I. I told Sue before that, you know, I, I say it, it's, my life's an open book. You can ask me anything, you know what I mean? And I'm, I'll be, I'll give you an honest answer. I mean, the fact that you, you were not even there, man, is so ridiculous, you know? <laughs> the fact that we don't have any record of you ever hurting Yvonne, is that correct? Yeah, I, I had uh, only one time was it anything that was of an altercation and it was a car door. Yeah, a car door? Yep. What, what do you mean? Uh, there was, I was coming back from Alliance, or my bad, Streetsboro at the uh, uh, Walmart, and the girl that I was dating at the time, Amy, she's driving. All of a sudden, this car just flies up onto our, onto our, this call is originating from an Ohio correctional facility and may be recorded and monitored. They're tailgating us, and, I mean, she kind of like, you know, the brake check, 
you know. Mm. They backed off, and then they were right back on. And I told her, I was like, pull over, let them pass. Yeah. When she pulled over, they pulled over. So I, I get out of the car. The guy gets out of the car. He's arguing with me. But I, I, I told him, I'm like, man, just get off the ass of our car, you know. Mm. And we kind of got into an argument there, and I kicked the door shut. That's it. And she was in the car. Yeah. Yeah, Amy was the one driving the car. And who was with that guy? Uh, that was actually Dick Badger, which happens to be a <laughs> sit-in judge in the county that I lived in, in Portage County. Mm. And was uh, <laughs> who who was with her? Who was with the with the guy in the car? His wife. Okay, so probably has nothing to do with the case, right? Nothing. Yeah, but you but there is no record of you ever hurting Yvonne? No. Yeah. I have no I have no record of hurting any woman that I've ever dated. Yeah. And then out of all of those people, they would come after you. Once they got to Joe, he even said like the first couple of times, like why are you talking to me and what's he got to do with this? And then I think I don't know how many different times they talked to him before they finally got him to say the story that they wanted him to. Mm. But even in the one, I noticed it, and I want to say that their last name is Prendergast or something like that. They were the uh, the psychologists that do the pre-sentence investigation. Mm. And I even asked her about it, and she said that she, she laughed because she said that you noticed that because... Joe even referred to himself in third person. Mm. And she said that that's where she would like to testify because that sounds like somebody reading something. Yeah, because when you would read your own name off of a written statement, you would put yourself as a third person, right? Right. Yeah. And I don't think, uh, uh, I could be wrong, but I don't think that Joe was like stable, like men mentally stable. No, he he went to a uh, I don't want to say special school because it wasn't like it was for any type of overall mental capacity type thing. He went to a special school as far as like the attention deficit disorder and or behavioral. Hmm. But he he had some sort of neurological thing that he would shake almost. I mean, his nickname was even Shaky. So, I mean, it's like uh, almost a Parkinson's mm. type shake to where it goes. And then, you know, whenever he gets excited or doing anything, you know, it, it goes even worse. But he's, I mean, it's not that I got the best of grades in school or anything either, but I wasn't constantly failing as he was. They were pretty much just putting him through and putting him on somebody else's mm. You know, giving it to another teacher to make him somebody else's problem. This call is originating from an Ohio correctional facility and may be recorded and monitored. I think Joe was struggling. He had some issues that he was struggling with. Yeah. Yeah. So tell me something. How long exactly have you spent and how much more to go? Uh, I was arrested in I was arrested July 14th of 99 so it's 22 now so I mean the year 2000 was a zero but it's it's a whole year I did it so that counts mm -hmm. so you figure I've got 22 in and even though they gave me 20 years jail time credit so that I see the parole board in my lifetime because I guess it's mandatory that you see the parole board once in your life and I would go up to see the board in uh, 2061 on my birthday, December 20th of 2061. 2061. Yep. But it it does it doesn't it doesn't count because they gave me life without. So in theory, it's you know you're here for your natural life. So basically, it's a uh, it's a death by incarceration. Correct. Yeah. But on paper, on paper they make it look good, so it doesn't sound so bad. Hmm. Uh, I wanted to go back and ask you about uh, a couple of things in mind. Like, for, first of all, uh, Ivan was in the middle of a 
um, pending lawsuit with the hospital, and a lot of money was involved. Is that correct? That's what she told me, yes. Hmm. We weren't able to find any uh, record of it, but not being the attorney, you know what I mean? There, nobody's going to admit to any type of lawsuit. Hmm. But she had, she had paperwork that was that she had, I think, almost $100,000 where she was going to give it to certain family members and certain friends as she wanted to leave, and then she wanted them to be not necessarily, you know, over money, but kind of pay off everything that they owed or whatever and just kind of get them caught up in life and leave it at that. Yeah. And, and thank God that you were somewhere else. Uh, I mean, you have a perfect alibi. Uh, because, uh, I mean, just imagine that even after having a perfect alibi, they came after you. So God only knows what must have happened if there was no alibi. Oh, yeah. they. I mean, they hung me out to dry knowing that it's not me. They don't care. I mean, it's, it's, it's as sad as it is. It's as simple as that. They don't care. There was even the one whenever they went up to uh, try to interview one of the detectives on there. In his own words, he said, let him out. I don't care. So, I mean, what is, what is that? I mean, because if if you're the detective and you know that somebody is completely guilty, you would have never said let him out. Yeah. Because if, 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 if you felt strong enough to get into law enforcement to be a policeman, to put criminals away, you would do everything in your power to make sure that you kept somebody away. Mm. That's not something that they would just throw out there as a joke either. Yeah, it would go against the whole thing. It just turns the case upside down. The detective is saying that, let him out, I don't care. Right. Yeah. So would he, you know, would he come on record and fight for you? I highly doubt it because he didn't yeah. even want to talk to them. He talked to them over the car as he just walked away. Hmm. Okay, so it was just like, okay, do whatever you want to do, I don't care. Essentially, at least that's what was conveyed to me. Because, hmm. you know, I'm, I'm getting everything secondhand. Which is ridiculous, you know. You should be calling the shots. You know, you should be in the driver's seat, and then you getting everything secondhand, so... Well, that was, that was the problem. Sue and I, okay, you got to figure that we've spent 20 years on this mm. everybody else just kind of reads the website in 20 minutes mm. so you know there's people that she has talked to and people that have said that you need to talk to this person and so forth and so forth you know the snowball effect but that's the problem we gave them a list this call is originating from an ohio correctional facility and may be recorded and monitored we gave them a comprehensive list of everybody that they needed to talk to and, and yet, the only ones that they really talked to are the ones that were against me at the trial. And they never really tried to seek out anybody else that was on my benefit. Yeah, it's, a, it's two decades of uh, unjustness and unfairness that those who would help you exonerate are never put on the record, which is like really, really fucked up for me. I just don't understand how this could occur, but it has occurred. Yeah, over and over, because there's, I, I mean, there's, of all things, two different eyewitnesses that they withheld from me for Brady violations. Absolutely. Those instances would have, they've gotten other people out, and yet I've had two of them and they've thrown it away. The DNA they won't do, the footprint in the blood doesn't match anybody's size. They got a foot or a fingerprint on a knife that doesn't match either one of us. And yet they still say that that could potentially be the murder weapon. These are different things that, you know, have gotten other people out. And yet all mine are considered uh, uh, how they eloquently said it, that it was, you know, harmless error. Just my life, so they don't care. I sit here and eat, eat ramen noodle soups and they go to dinner.
Seven, 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 seven,